everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name's Solome Tibabu. I'm the founder of Going Digital Behavioral Health Tech, which is the largest community focused on expanding access to mental health and substance use services through tech and innovation. And I'm so excited for this topic. I know that every panelist must said this about their panel, but I couldn't think of a more important topic. <laughs> uh, we're talking about youth mental health today, trauma, children, and America's mental health crisis. And I couldn't be more pleased to be joined by these amazing leaders to talk about how their organizations are leveraging their scale to impact this crisis. So to get started, why don't I go ahead and start with Kim and then Jim, please. So you're both local-based organizations with national footprints. Can you talk a little bit about how that informs how you're addressing the youth mental health crisis? Sure. Thank you, Solome, for moderating our panel. Thanks, everyone, for joining the conversation. I'm Kim Keck. I run what's called the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. We ensure one in three Americans. Collectively, the Blues serve 115 million people. And we are deeply lo uh, rooted, rather, in our communities locally. You're right, Solome. And... Um, we take what we do very seriously when it comes to healthcare, of course, right? The traditional healthcare role of putting together networks of providers, putting together networks of doctors. But one of our big focuses is also health. So we do things like support programs that have to do with safe, affordable housing, or access to healthy food, or even supporting programs getting uh, patients rides to their doctor's office. Because we know these things dramatically impact a person's physical and mental health, right? 80% of what influences a person's health happens outside of the physician's office, as I'm sure all of you know. Then you add on top of that the youth in our country and what they have just survived in terms of these environmental factors over the last couple of years, right? Surviving a pandemic, dealing with increasing violence, often in schools, sadly, right? thinking about being one of the first generations to grow up, being digitally native, which is really new and exciting, but also really complicated at this really vulnerable time of emotional and mental growth. And we know 2021, we've looked at numbers, we look at them all the time. We've heard and we've read and we've seen 37% of high schoolers report being in poor mental health. 44% report being persistently sad or hopeless. I mean, think about that. Think about 10 children you know, and more than four out of 10 of them, persistently sad or hopeless. We know that the emergency room visits are up dramatically for children, for mental health services. In the first year of the pandemic, north of 30% increase, and sadly, it has not subsided. So, look, we're committed to use our local footprint, our local community-based focus, our local focus on health to make a difference. We have about 250 programs across the blues working on a range of issues on youth mental health from support services like integrating with primary care, helping primary care physicians get the support services they need to address the mental health needs of their patients, supporting schools in getting the support they need to navigate these complex issues. So we're proud of our work. We're really, uh, really focused on getting every child the help they need to get through this mental health crisis. And we know there's more to do, but we have a start. Amazing. And Jim? Great. Well, like Kim, uh, Boys and Girls Clubs of America is a, a federated model. So we have a national umbrella with a local footprint in, in 5,000, a little over 5,000 communities across the country. Um, so that uh, equally gives us the uh, ability to touch down at the local level when it comes to issues that affect young people. And our core areas of focus are on academic success, good character and citizenship, and healthy lifestyles, which we're gonna be talking about today. And obviously, as Kim said, one of the most important parts of a healthy lifestyle is mental health. And what's happened over the past um, several years has only exacerbated really what started a long time ago when it comes to the mental state of kids in America today. Uh, great statistics Kim uh, put out, but there's a couple more that I think um, really start to paint the picture in terms of what we're dealing with, and we'll get to a couple solutions in a minute, um, but you look at kids today, and two out of three young people in America 
will have some kind of trauma event by the time they're 16 years old. And what we do know is those trauma events lead to unfortunate outcomes in their life. It's cause for alcoholism, substance abuse, um, it's cause for incarceration, uh, bad relationships, academic poor performance. All of these things matriculate from trauma-related um, events that, that kids experience. Um, to take a couple statistics that Kim said and to you know, paint a, a, a different picture, um, if you were to imagine your high school in your community and imagine it having a thousand kids in it, um, and that's roughly the size of most high schools in our country. Uh, as Kim said, 420 of those kids would have some level of persistent sadness or hopelessness in their lives. 220 will have contemplated suicide, and 100 of them will have tried or committed suicide. That's how dramatic and serious this issue is when it comes to the state of mental health for kids uh, in America today. So um, Boys and Girls Clubs of America and all of our local uh, organizations are focused on healthy lifestyles, yes, but also dealing with the mental health challenges that kids are facing. It was bad before the pandemic. Um, it was already on the rise in terms of some of these health dynamics, mental health dynamics, but the pandemic and COVID-19 only exacerbated it to where we are today. Mm -hmm. and it's starting to also take an effect. If you saw the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal this past week, um, you saw graphically um, what's happening to reading and math levels for kids in this country as a result of COVID-19. Uh, lowest levels in decades. And I believe that that's just the start of the slide that we're gonna see the next few years. And that's gonna impact us all five, 10 years down the road when it comes to our workforce and really uh, our kids and what they'll be able to do or not do in this country. It's just astounding to think about the effects that childhood trauma has in so many ways for ongoing years. Now, I understand this isn't the first time that Blue Cross Blue Shield Association and Boys and Girls Club has connected. <laughs> you've, uh, you've worked together before? So I have personally worked with the Boys and Girls Club and our, our organizations have as well. But one of the things when we were uh, talking about this potential partnership is I reflected on my Boys and Girls Club experience as a child because, and then into adulthood. So when I was a kid, I went to Boys and Girls Clubs after school because that's what all kids did. And I used to get really frustrated because my activities ended before my brother's activities. His always went long for some reason. I think it was <laughs> baseball. And we had to wait around for my brother to finish. So, But on a more positive note, when I was running Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island, which is a role I had prior to my current role, I had the opportunity to partner with the local Boys and Girls Club in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, where my parents grew up. So I was born and raised in Rhode Island, moved away for many, many, many years, came back to run Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island. And my team said, hey, could you go to um, this community-based event we have? It's with the Boys and Girls Club. They're a great, trusted local partner. And we're going to this club in Pawtucket. And it was a club, when I walked in, I felt instantly at home. It was a club, again, in the town that my, or the city really, working class town that my parents grew up in. And I thought, you know, this is exactly the kind of organization I want to connect with. So it, I've only have the most, uh, utmost respect and affinity for what you do and, and your organization, Jim. Well, feelings are mutual. And what has been really great to see is so many of our local boys and girls clubs have partnered with Blue Cross Blue Shield over the years on efforts, uh, you know, different efforts across uh, the country and at different times. Uh, so yes, we've worked together before and that, that's great. And I think what we're going to talk about in a minute in terms of what's in front of us in terms of a partnership is going to be equally exciting. Um, I will say this, um, when we look at the state of mental health and these challenges that we just pointed to, uh, the solutions um, aren't always real clear. And one size does not fit all. Um, it takes a lot of different community assets coming together to really solve for this problem and to come up with solutions. And we think we have one piece uh, of that solution that we're going to talk about. Um, but at Boys and Girls Clubs, one of the unique components that exists in our enterprise is not just the local ability to, to serve youth and families, but that trusted 
advisor, that trusted place where kids and families go, and they know that the kids are going to be safe there, and they're going to get the types of support services that they need. So trust is a huge, huge part of what we do. And we also study the experiences that youth have at, at clubs. So for example, um, one thing we know is that 85% of kids that come to the Boys and Girls Club feel a sense of belonging by being there, compared to 30% of school-age kids that feel that same way about their school. So these types of information points really give us the framework, if you will, for where we're going to launch off and do more work around trauma-informed care, trauma-informed practice to help more kids and really help them be successful as they go forward. Oh, I just love that story so much. And no surprise that you've had an experience with Boys and Girls Club, Kim, because just the expansive reach of both of your yeah. organizations is, is incredible. And uh, you know, Jim, what you said about trust and having an opportunity for youth to connect with people they can trust. You know, as I, I got into this space as an anxious teen myself, and just the stigma around my parents not even having a vocabulary for the phrase obsessive compulsive disorder and panic attacks, it was that my ability to connect with folks at school and, and elsewhere, it, I can't, here I'm starting to answer my next question for both of you. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> so, uh, you know, on the bright side, it's wonderful that more people, now everyone it seems, is talking about mental health, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about who you two think is really equipped to make a difference yeah. in this topic. Well, you started to answer it because I think the short answer is everyone, right? It's, there is no shortage of need, and so I don't think we should stop short in terms of the solutions that we create. In fact, I started to talk about this, and I love some of the words you use, Jim. I was going to use them, and I'll, I will reuse them, right? Trust, safe, health, well-being. So many of those things are top of mind for us. And what we've done to date in terms of addressing this issue, as I mentioned a moment ago, we have 250 programs across the country that Blue Cross Blue Shield plans are partnering with many entities uh, to address their unique needs in their communities. So uh, New Jersey, for example, that Blue Cross Blue Shield plan there has an ability for teens to text directly with a counselor in their community, often from their community, so that that counselor might understand what's happening in that child's life. And the Michigan plan, we partner with the University of Michigan on creating psychiatric service support for primary care at the time of visit, we do something similar in Tennessee. We work with, I think, a local chapter of the American um, Academy of Pediatrics on training pediatricians to recognize and treat lo less complex needs of mental health at the time of visit. We do mental health first aid training in Kansas City and many other places, and many of the Blues across the country last year at this time and earlier launched and supported the 988 um, launch in 2022, I guess it was just last year, um, but fund a lot of that support work as well, right? There's, there's so many things that we do in the communities. Again, I still think there's room for more and, and room for scale, which we'll talk about in a minute. So I, I think just piggybacking on what, what Kim's talking about, um, when we see kids at Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, yes, a lot of the statistics I shared are true, but there's a silver lining inside of that cloud as well. Um, we also know that 91% of kids that come to, the, to Boys and Girls Clubs feel safe emotionally and physically being there. Um, so it's a huge platform to launch from when we're talking about mental health and, and trauma that they've experienced uh, in their lives. Second of all, um, kids are also optimistic about the future and they see themselves as change makers mm. in this country, which again gives a great platform when we have to you know, dive into some of these challenging topics that we face. And yes, um, they are impacted by social media, they're impacted by the violence in the community, the violence at home, the disruptors at home, all of these things um, are what they're dealing with. But then they come to an environment where they feel safe, 
They feel they have a trusted advisor, mentor uh, to work with them that's trained and has the ability to help. And that starts to put together this recipe where we feel we can have a much greater level of impact. And I think we're going to start getting into what that is. <laughs> well, I, I love the discussion about solutions, and I'm, I'm definitely going to be asking you both more about that. But for those who might not be so familiar, I'd like to ask a big question around what do you each think is the root of where these problems have, have come in from? Well, we've, we've talked a little bit about root causes. Look, there are endless root causes. We talked about what's happened even in the last couple of years, but Jim, you just mentioned this a few times, so I would sort of piggyback on what you said on one main cause is trauma. And just maybe give you a little story. Um, I was telling someone the story last night. It, it invokes so many more questions because I have this memory of the story that it is indelible, but the, the um, 10 or so years ago, my daughter was in high school in a uh, suburb in Connecticut, a really large public high school, diverse high school, and a great high school where she probably left with, I don't know, four or five college courses because of the AP credit and the like. But anyway, really diverse high school. When she came home from her freshman year, I think it was, she came home one day and she said that they had a lecture in the auditorium with all students in the auditorium. And the lecturer asked a question that had to do with anyone in the auditorium knowing someone who was murdered. And I was like, wait, what? You were asked what? And she said, mommy, people raise their hand. And I thought, Oh my gosh, like on so many levels, so many things went through in my mind, but imagine the trauma that someone faces when that's the experience you've had as a child, right? And to, to go a little bit more into the numbers, Jim, we, we think alike, I know, but um, so, we, so to build on your statistics on the trauma, right? CDC, same thing, reports the same thing. We, you mentioned one of the statistics that's top of my mind, but another one related to this issue of adverse experiences as children, it's something like one in six adults report having four or more adverse experiences as a child that have long-lasting impacts into someone's physical and mental health. So part of what we're getting here is that root cause issue that isn't just for addressing children. It's fantastic. It absolutely is focused here. But we're also thinking about the long term, right, and thinking about how we create something sustainable to get at this issue of uh, moving beyond where we are today in a, um, you know, a long-standing way. Yeah, I, I think there, there definitely are some root causes, and you all know what they are. You know, for years, it's been ignored, um, misdiagnosed, um, it's been, you know, suppressed. Um, you know, th that wasn't something we talked about 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, second of all, to, to a little bit of the point about technology, it's a double-edged sword. Um, it helps in so many ways, but our young people today get so much information, communication coming through those devices, and it's not all good. Um, it's it's cyberbullying, you know. It, it's bullying on at school. All of these things um, have exacerbated over the course of the decades. Um, and then you, you compound this with um, just the challenges kids face and what they're seeing on cable TV, streaming, everything. And, it, and it's a, just a more violent time in terms of what young people are, are seeing. And so, you know, you start to add all these things together and it's where the collision comes in terms of the trauma and stress and anxiety um, that young people are, are truly facing today. Um, at the same time, um, you know, those are root causes. There's a lot of other causes that, that definitely feed into this. Uh, you know, we're living in a different society that we see violence every day. You know, it's what the media focuses on and, and, and certainly what um, we all pay attention to. Our, our young people see that too and, and realize um, the stress there. I'll also say that th this affects everyone, every young person in this country. It is not segmented or segregated um, by population in, in any means. It, it can affect everyone. My own son um, went through this during the pandemic. And to give you an example, just a couple nights ago, we have a program called Youth of the Year where we recognize our um, youth in, in different regions and states across the country and it rolls up to a national event. We were in New York and had our, our New York Youth of the Year. And one of the finalists stood up, he was from Ghana, um, and talked about his experience coming to this country. It, it certainly has been a life changer. But he talked about how he didn't speak the language 
and how he was treated because of that, how he looked different, dressed different, and how he was bullied because of that, how difficult it was to you know, walk to school without getting mugged or, or attacked by, by a gang. All of these things you know, compiled, and he talked about the story of not once but twice walking up to the roof of his apartment building and thinking about jumping off. Um, these are young people, and to have that kind of thought pattern, I think, again, going back to the, to, to the beginning, really is what's scary, and that's why it's so important we're focused on, on this today. Um, so I think those are some of the root causes and, and some of the outward expressions we're seeing when it comes yeah. to what kids think they need to do. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate the emphasis that you both have have placed on how dire the situation is at this moment in time. You know, many of us know the impacts of COVID on our young people has accelerated what's already a, a horrible situation, but, but those impacts are going to be ongoing and we all need to make an investment in solving these issues, which segues me into my next question around what does action look like and how, how else, how do we solve it? Yeah, yeah, so let's move to the more optimistic portion of our conversation. <laughs> I think we covered uh, the challenge, right? It's, it's, and I don't mean to trivialize it because it's not um, to be trivialized. Uh, Look, I think we're proud of what we do at Blue Cross Blue Shield plans across the country. I took this role a couple of years ago, and when I did take this role, I loved, loved, loved running Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island. It was a great little place you could experiment in so many different ways. I often joke, but this tent actually might be larger than the state of Rhode Island, and you could put people in the same room who could solve real problems, and we often the boys and girls clubs, but lots of really smart, interested people, not unlike uh, what we have in front of us today, and I loved, loved, loved that, loved that. The reason I came to the association to take on this role was the real desire to sort of think about these issues at scale and to find partners that could help us scale some of the great things that were happening locally across the country. We wanted a partner that has all the attributes we've been talking about today, having trust, having local community focus, being in a safe place. We will also talk about being trauma-informed. So we, yesterday, announced, and I'm pleased to share, we, Blue Cross Blue Shield Plans, are partnering with the Boys and Girls Club of America to address our youth mental health crisis. Thank you. Uh-oh, I think we're supposed to get a pick on that, but. <laughs> Whoever Where's wanted it? that pick, <laughs> get it now. Anyway, but, and importantly, here's what that means. So by 2026, up to 5,000 boys and girls clubs will be trauma-informed. 48,000 trained staff members will be helping children navigate their emotional and mental well, mental well being at clubs across the country. Back to that, in a safe place. 3.6 million children will be positively impacted. So we're really excited to get build on the great work you've been doing and launch this great work and really get to this notion of this trauma-informed care, right? We, we've mentioned the word trauma-informed a number, number of times, but really helping create pathways for our children to work through these adverse experiences in ways that put them on pathways to healing and really excited to get started. So a couple details, um, getting at what, what's actually going to happen. Um, there's really four main components to this partnership and, and the work that we're going to do together. First and foremost is to, as Kim said, integrate trauma-informed practice, trauma-informed care into every Boys and Girls Club across the country. And to do that, um, we'll have a massive um, training and education and development program for staff. Um, and actually, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 staff will also become certified as a specialist in this area so that they can truly help young people uh, to a certain degree. Um, inside of that training, it's all about meeting kids and teens where they're at. And it's also being able to recognize and being aware of when there's a situation or a behavior or an action happening inside of a facility that truly is trauma related and then being able to address it. So that's where all the training really is about. Third, it's developing programs, initiatives that young people 
kids and teens will be able to participate in that truly gets at helping them understand how they can better de-escalate emotion, better manage stress, be more resilient when it comes to things coming at them like bullying and these other types of issues that I talked about. Um, so all of those programs are being developed with the help of 43 subject matter experts um, from the Marshfield Clinic to uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to uh, Duke University Medical Center, um, all coming together to really help build these programs. So yes, staff will be able to train and help young people, but then also help young people understand how they can self-help themselves. And then the, the next component of it will we'll really focus on access. Um, and that's another place where we will come together with Blue Cross Blue Shield and use some of their resources, their employees, their staff to also help right on the ground at Boys and Girls Clubs. And we're going to test out some things. You know, Kim gave a great example that we'd like to see expand where there can be remote or online therapy that kids and teens will be able to access. So that'll be something we pilot and we look to roll out and, and build upon um, as we uh, move forward with, with, with the partnership. Um, so th those are a couple of the starting to get at some of the details uh, when it comes to what we're actually going to be doing. Um, so all of this is starting right now. Um, we're, we're not waiting. We're getting to work on it. Um, obviously, these types of partnerships don't get built overnight. We've been talking for a long time, so we've had the benefit of getting a, a start on this uh, as we sit here today. So, so we're excited about that, and we're excited about what it'll do for young people um, at Boys and Girls Clubs. Again, as I said before, this is one piece, one component of what kids and teens are going to need in this country. And all of us uh, in this room and in this country need to play a role in helping our young people really develop uh, into the future. Wow. I'll just say, on behalf of all of us, we are just delighted to see this amazing partnership with two large-scale, powerful organizations that not only have that national reach, but also that trust and community at the local level. And so if I could sneak in maybe one more question before we turn to audience Q&A. What can I expect to see in, in the future, in the next year, but maybe even what do you individually hope to come out of this partnership? Either way. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Um, so. You know, if you, you think a year, and, and Kim mentioned an important date, 2026. Um, what, what we're not saying is there's a lot of milestones, <laughs> a lot of goals, uh, a lot of benchmarks that we have set in place to really ensure that everything we're talking about here happens and, and comes to life. And we truly believe that a partnership um, has to have those really concrete goals and objectives, and that this has to be at the top of the house in terms of uh, visibility and in terms of making sure things are executed the way that we want to. So, you know, we look out next year and the next couple of years after, and it, it really is what Kim said, and the number of staff that'll be trained, the number that'll be certified as specialists, but most importantly, it really gets down to the young people that will be impacted by what we do. We measure the experience emotionally and physically that youth have at every single boys group, over 5,000 in this country, by facility, we know what that experience is. And what we want to see happen is that emotional safety experience continue to rise over the course of time. And then second of all is we track the number of incidents, if you will, or the number of um, occasions where a young person is expressing some level of trauma in their life and what we're able to do uh, to assist. And yes, sometimes it's just being aware and then having the tools to help address that. But we, we're only going to be able to go so far. And so the other stage will be referrals. Um, where we're able to refer young people to um, a different level of therapy or a different level of help, again, with the support of Blue Cross Blue Shield, and we'll be able to understand what that looks like as well. So perhaps what wasn't happening at all, we'll now be able to say these are the numbers of youth that are getting support, getting help, and or advanced help as it's needed. Yeah. 
Totally agree. I just might say ditto. But I would say, maybe I'd add one thing, 100% agree with everything you said. Look, this is more than a moment in time, right? This is about the long term, but it's helping kids today and helping kids today, as we talked about earlier, not just survive, but thrive and thrive even past, you know, their formative years, if you will, into adulthood in a safe place with a trusted community-based organization. We have Blue Cross Blue Shield, a uh, strategy of creating a better system of health, right? We specifically don't say a better healthcare system. I, I, I have an allergic reaction to those words, but a better system <laughs> of health, one that's rooted in serving everyone and is equitable. And I couldn't think of a better partner to do this work. And we cannot, than the Boys and Girls Club, and we cannot have a better system of health if we don't have support for mental health. So we're excited. One of the things we didn't say, and I think it's implicit, but I'll just sort of sneak in Embedded in all that great work is some funding. Um, so we're uh, proud to have multi-year commitments to this work to support all of the things that you said. But you know, again, I would just say thank you, Jim. The partnership, the chemistry, the mission, the shared vision, the passion, the connection of who we are and what we do was obvious from hello. So thrilled to be partnering with you. Yeah, yes, please. Thank you. I think inside of what Kim said, it's also important to know that when we look at mental health across the country, a lot of times it's focused on adults. Um, and, and we see that uh, in, in homelessness and in so many other ways and, and, and a lot of the violence that surfaces. Um, we don't always see a lot of focus on young people, on, on youth. And so to me, I, I hope another big outcome of this partnership is a much higher level of awareness in this country of the challenges that young people are facing and what some of the solutions are that we're developing and others uh, to help those young people be successful and have a great future because that in the end is really what this um, truly is all about. And it's a journey. Um, it's really hard to say in a year the problem's fixed. Um, it won't be, um, but I think by the system and, and some of the things we're putting in place, um, we're gonna be able to make a bigger difference and help a lot of young people be more successful in life um, because of it. Um, and it. And it really is for us like a four-step process. It starts with readiness and it goes to awareness and then it goes into um, responsiveness and then you get to this informed state where you can really make that difference. Um, so I think there's a lot of other things we look to see um, coming from this. and. Um, you'll see in the press release, I'll say it because um, the generosity from Blue Cross Blue Shield is phenomenal. Um, they're investing $10 million um, in this initiative with Boys and Girls Club. So thank you, Kim. Amazing. Thank you both, Kim, Jim. Really appreciate hearing more about this amazing partnership. And now I think we can turn to audience Q&A. I believe there's a mic running around. I, I saw her first. So. Mm -hmm. Mr. Clark, nice to see you again. Penry Gustafson, I, I South Carolina it. Senator. <laughs> and Ms. Keck, um, uh, I can't tell you how delighted I am to hear about this partnership. Um, I have to say, because I am an elected official, on behalf of the Teen Boys and Girls Club, and one of the largest ones in America is in my hometown with Brian Mays. Can we be part of your test? Start with us, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Yay! Is that, oh, wait, wait, is that on record? Okay, yeah. Okay, great. Absolutely, whoever's recording. That's great. Uh, I, I just want to add, um, partnerships come in all different kind of ways. And, and, and I'll, I've, I'll use the one, uh, the Boys and Girls Club in my hometown, the Teen Jackson Center. Uh, Mr. Mays, who's the director, has been looking for funding for several years. And... Um, and it's held them back. Sure. Because everybody needs money to do anything, sure. right? Sure. So when I heard his plight, I thought, where can I get him some money, like, now? <laughs> and, um, and not, like, through the state budget, because it's a very long process and nothing is, you know, uh, for certain. So uh, I got a partnership going with our DJJ, mm -hmm. Department yeah. of Juvenile Justice. And what I found out was, you know, they spent about $32,000 per child per year at DJJ. And I was asking for like 20,000 somehow. And Eden Hendrick, the director, came up with 40. 
immediately out of their budget. Mm-hmm. And they were able to launch all kinds of programs. The these these teen these teen uh, centers, um, and your boys and, and girls clubs of America are so vitally important. They provide the foundation of these children's lives. A lot of times, this is where they're g- getting their education done. That's uh, they're getting positive feedback. They're learning things, and with the mental health. I mean, I, I've got goosebumps. I'm, I, I just thank Blue Cross so much um, because we can't, organizations like these just can't do that on their own. So I just want to thank you both again, Camden, South Carolina, <laughs> Brian oh. Mays, Mr. Clark, I you're, got you on record. You're hired. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, you really, y'all do amazing work. Thank you so thank much. You. Absolutely. Thank you. We got her next. Mm-hmm. I'm Sabrina Bram. I'm a pediatrician from Stanford. Um, First of all, thank you so much for partnering to think about this incredibly important subject. Um, I'm hoping to offer a an additional perspective. As pediatricians, we um, work with families over the life course. And so when we think of this mental health crisis, what we actually think of is a developmental aberration, right? We're working with families over the course of their lifespan. And the developmental aberration really comes from um, environmental insults over time, to your point about trauma, but also toxic stress, and then things like lack of green space, housing insecurity, food insecurity, food supply. Forget about screens and things like that. And so, um, you know, when we think about the 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 answers that we're creating for mental health, a lot of them to people like me feel like plugging a hole in the boat yeah. versus building a better boat, which in my mind is supporting families yeah. to support their children. Yeah. And so, my question for you is. Um, how do we think about better supporting? So who are the people who are supporting families? Yeah. How are we thinking about supporting them better uh, in terms of all of those social determinants? Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and how, um, wh- where do you see the opportunities to do that? Yeah, maybe I could add a perspective. So t- 100% understand and agree with your question. And this isn't an answer that's at scale because I found, <laughs> Finding scale solutions in so much of what we do is hard. But just to give you a little bit of insight into one of the Blue Cross Blue Plan, Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, rather, it thinks about what you've described. And I happen to have some experience at this plan. So one of the things that that plan in Rhode Island did is created a a life index with a partner, Brown University School of Public Health, to understand the factors in, um, so influencing a person's ability to have a healthy life, like living in a safe neighborhood. What's the violence? Do you feel comfortable going outside? Do you have a risk of incarceration? To, do you have transportation to your doctor's office? Do you have a safe place to live? Basic life questions that are not always um, you know, that aren't necessarily addressed uh, generally in, in what we do in healthcare. So we partnered with the Brown School of Public Health to create this index. The reason we created that index was then to go and convene agencies, private sector, public sector, governmental, say, how are we going to then use the data we get out of this to support families on the kinds of things that they say they can't have a healthy life, they can't get their kid to a pediatrician appointment, because it takes too long to take three bus transfers, and it only happens when they can get work that's, you know, they can't get out of work because there is no unpaid time at the, at the time of this survey. So in any case, we created a series of programs. We created a convening of all the organizations in the state. Again, in a really small state, it was easier to do, to say, all right, how are we going to prioritize the support systems so people want to live here safely, healthy, mentally, physically? And then we had, at the time, a great governor who also said, look, at the end of the day, if we do these things right, this is also about our economic health as a state, because if this is a great place to raise families, we sustain our economy and more. Not that that was the basis for it, but it's a component of it. So there are programs like that that the Blues Fund support across the country. Again, we've thought about creating those kinds of things at scale. Lots of Blue Cross Blue Shield plans have significant amount of funding to social needs to help families, but they're they're not 
they're generally tied to what that community needs best and not sort of one size fits all across the country. But just to give you a sense of Rhode Island of what we did, and again, the last thing I'd say to emphasize, what we were finding that was happening to this point of fragmentation and trying to find scale is, you know, and I was on the board of the food bank and the food bank would have an initiative that looked similar to what the, the domestic violence shelter at the time was doing. And so we said, look, we're, we're sub-optimizing. Let's just put our resources together take the data that comes out of the health equity index and figure out how to address the most poignant needs. And then, oh, by the way, let's actually get our health systems involved because it turns out, you know, they can't necessarily discharge of someone from the hospital who doesn't have a place to go. And again, if I put my health insurer hat on, then I'm just paying to to someone who's not really getting any better and is not in a good place. So anyway, we did a lot of convening in that way that was pretty effective in, in, in that one instance. I, I just add, I, clearly you're spot on. Um, and kind of backing up into you know, what Boys and Girls Clubs is all about, we take a holistic approach. Um, and you're right, it's not one thing. It is about nutrition, it's about healthy food. Um, you know, it's not well known, but we serve 60, 70 million meals a year um, to, to young people. Um, on top of that, yes, there's a, a family connection. Where that conne connection exists, um, I think we all know uh, the challenges in many communities of single parent households or alternative caregivers. So, you know, it's complicated. Um, but, but yes, I mean, it takes a lot of assets coming together. And it's not a one size fits all to, to really help support that young person. You know, today we're talking about one topic. Um, and we could be talking about multiple um, to, to go to your point. Um, I'd also say this, you know, to your point about the community, you know, one study, it was actually Rhode Island um, that was done by the American Journal of Medicine. Um, we didn't commission it, they just did it, and it, it really assessed community assets. Um, it looked at, you know, religious institutions, libraries, community centers, um, other um, uh, youth-serving organizations, and it compared it to violence in the community. And we were so shocked and happy to see the result. There's only one that made a difference, and it was Boys and Girls Clubs. Uh, in that community. So it really gave us a lot of energy around um, a lot of different topics that we need to focus on uh, to ensure that we have a role in making sure the neighborhood or the community is safe, um, that youth are safe physically and, of course, as we're talking about today, emotionally. So the, 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 you're, you're so right. It's, it's, it's a, a big wheel of things, and this is just one of them. Mm -hmm. Um, Boys and Girls Club of the Peninsula was the first organization to offer meals to families. Our fa my family went and, and supported them, but so I just want to shout out to you guys. It was a great, a well, great moment. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See, maybe one or two more. I think he's been waiting over here. Somebody. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Adit Narello Gupta. I'm a, uh, a student at Columbia University studying to become a psychotherapist. And e despite the fact that I'm very early in my career, there's one refrain that I hear from people in my milieu. So people who are frontline workers, working with families, children, adults, to try to work through this trauma that we talk about. And that is that if you want to be able to afford a starter home in your 30s and you're accepting insurance, you better find a rich partner. <laughs> And for me, as I, I'm really curious to hear from you, Ms. Keck, mm -hmm. about what you guys need from us yeah. at, to, to, to be able to support us better yeah. so that you know that the work that we're doing is valuable and that we can, like, as I say, I'm a young person. I'm scared about not being able to do this thing that I really love. Yeah. Um, but I would, I, I would hope for a future where we, we can work together to do the work that we really yeah, need to. I totally agree. You know, one of the things we are challenged with this issue at all the time, and so from my end, what, what, what I did when I was in Rhode Island is I said, okay, I don't have enough clinicians to treat this mental health crisis in, this, in the state, and the waiting lists are horrific, as, as we all know. So we went to the the clinicians in the community from psychiatrists to clinical social workers and said, so what would it take for you to join our network? Because we're, we're spinning doing what we're doing today in terms of the supply of clinicians. It's just way too low for the demand. And, and we heard back from a number of them that they wouldn't join it at any, 
and ever because their panels were completely full. They were doing exactly the work that they wanted to do. And um, they didn't want to go through the administrivia of being part of a network. Now, I think that's changing a little. There, I don't think any of them may be here, I don't think, but there are entities that are trying to be that administrative hub to help small, independent, in particular, therapists become part of a network to say, I don't want to have to deal with that administrivia. So that's a little bit of a solution. The second way, candidly, we um, look to increase supply was pay a lot more. And we found n not as much uptake as you might s expect with a 50% increase. Mm -hmm. We also got rid of things like in Rhode Island prior authorization. We're like, why are we asking to do prior author authorization? We don't have enough physicians or clinicians as it is. What are we doing? Um, we got, we bundled payment. So as a patient, if you were going to see a psychiatrist and yet then you had, you wanted to be in an outpatient intensive program and you wanted to integrate in your care, we're like, why are we asking a patient to pay a copay every time they went in as if this was an episodic issue? Let's bundle that together in a way that makes sense for have uh, engagement, I hate that word, but have them complete a program that might help their mental health. So we we did a number of things. Is it enough? No. We, we There's not a zip code in this country. There might be a little in Massachusetts has a little bit of balance in terms of supply and demand, in terms of the demand for mental health, and then the supply of clinicians in network. That comes, I think, closest to being in equilibrium in Massachusetts, but just about nowhere else in the country. So uh, we are we're looking for ways to make that balance and more than been balanced. But I also think it's going to take some time. And that's why we're also making these kinds of investments, because as you train, as your colleagues train, it may take a few years right, to get that supply where we need. Um, but those are some of the things that we're focused on. Thanks for the question. Oh, awesome. Mark in oh, front here. Maybe one, one more I, I got time for. Mm -hmm. yeah. this oh, Good morning. Oh, oh sorry. You, my you. turn. Uh, <laughs> we can sneak in too yeah. if you have a clear question mark after your question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm Tom Ferry. I'm the executive director of the Sports and Society program here at the Aspen Institute. And congratulations, Kim and Jim, on this partnership. I think it holds incredible potential to address a very defined problem out there, given the importance of the Boys and Girls Clubs in America, which we worked with a little bit, and, and the insurance industry in general. My question for you is what role does sport, do sport programs, or could sport cr programs play mm -hmm. in this initiative? I mean, a little bit of context here. We've got the, the, the main work that we, the main initiative we have is something called Project Play, which is about building healthier children and communities through sports. And we work with the leagues and the media companies and grassroots players and otherwise. And we know that during the, during the pandemic, um, sport participation fell from about 57% down to 50.7%. And kids from the lowest income homes participate about half as often as kids from the upper income homes do. And the federal government has actually set a goal of 63.3% organized sport participation by, by 2030. And so what we did is working with our partners, we did a, a computer modeling saying, well, if we can move it from 51% to 63%, what would be the societal benefits, direct medical costs saved, uh, economic productivity, uh, you know, and we're, we're looking at mental health as well. And there are, it's about $57 billion in societal benefit alone. And, the mental health numbers were, were cranking. It's probably going to be another $30 billion in mental health uh, impacts because we know the benefits of kids being physically active, simply moving their bodies, and then being connected to other kids, being connected to other kids without the devices in their hands. So I'm curious, as you're building out these programs, what role do you see sports playing? And then from an insurance, uh, are, there, are there certain incentives you could put in place that would encourage access to quality sport experiences mm -hmm. uh, for the kids who have the least access. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a couple quick answers. Um, you know, one is you know, there's other benefits, right? The 
Childhood obesity rate is another epidemic that we're facing in this country. Um, and, and one thing we know at Boys and Girls Clubs is the kids that attend our clubs get more physical fitness every day than their peers in school do. So I do see a role, a uh, big role, and we'd love to talk to you afterwards about that. Uh, and on top of it, as you know, schools have really reduced and eliminated a lot of, you know, sports programs. Um, so we in many communities have taken over the leagues. Um, and for all the benefits that you state and more, right, because it goes back to uh, the person a little earlier, you know, th there's a holistic approach to this uh, that benefits. So I, I absolutely see that. Yeah. Yeah, we do a number of things to both support funding. We had a recess rocks in Rhode Island. Could talk about that at length, but I won't. It was really cool that had to do with uh, the children who didn't have access to safe places to, to do uh, any physical activity. But uh, more broadly in terms of what the blues and what insurance companies can do, there's a number of things we do with employers to incent wellness, to incent moving, right? We pay for things like steps. And um, if anyone has through their insurance, anything like an incentive for metabolic syndrome, right? You, you get all of your vitals tracked, but you also get sort of credit in your insurance premium to stay healthy and to actually uh, perform uh, along the biometric screenings that, you know, I felt like it was a test when I was taking it to say, oh my God, did, did I move enough today? So yeah, we do a number of those things that are more sort of premium reduction incentives to get uh, all of us moving and focused on health. Awesome. Okay, 20 oh, seconds. 20 seconds, I'll be very <laughs> We're gonna brief. get thank the boot. Uh, yeah. Good morning, uh, thank you. Um, I'm Mark Del Monte, I'm the CEO of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and so on behalf of the pediatricians in the United States, thank you for hosting this session, Kim and Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. If I'm not wrong, this is the only session at this festival on child health. So mm -hmm. thank you for hosting it and bringing this issue to this meeting, a uh, very important. <laughs> Um, obviously, pediatricians are on the front line of this all day, every day. Children are showing up, very young children to young adults, sad, anxious, lonely, depressed, and have disordered eating. And so this is a crisis that has an urgent piece and a long-term piece. And my question to you all is, how do you think about that balance. We need to do something right now so that children are not sitting in emergency departments for days and weeks mm -hmm. when they have no place to go for their psychiatric concerns, uh, but also to rebuild the system to be able to provide more mental health. Yeah. One of the things I would say, Mark, and I 100% agree, it would turn your question into a statement, right? There, there are both. And we have tried to do you know, many, many things all at the same time to the notion that audit raised in terms of building that that new system of health, right? So we're focused right now mostly on the health side of healthcare because the healthcare side turns out it's a little complicated, right? As you well know, who knew? We knew. But in any case, there are many things we're doing on the healthcare side to drive the right supply, the right incentives, the right program, the right insurance design to stay healthy, to get the services that need, that we don't put barriers in front. And I think even those take time. So I, I'd say we're absolutely trying to balance that long-term, short-term, and say, there's not just one thing. Look, if there were one thing, we would all do it. But we're going to take uh, this opportunity to invest 10 million to do this for the long term and look for the immediate impacts where we can across the health ecosystem. Well, hats off to Kim um, and really her team too, because you know we, we certainly have a lot of supporters and investors and, um, Sometimes, a lot of times, it's we, we, we want to see this now. Um, Kim and her team's approach is, yes, we want to get this going and there's an urgency, um, but their view has always been long-term and that's how the investment is structured. So, um, bravo, hats off to Kim and her team. Okay. One more round of applause. Thank you so much.